And now on BBC Two, we've the final chapter of Arthur Hopcraft's acclaimed adaptation of Charles Dickens' classic work, Bleak House. Grateful for your brevity, as always, Mr. Tangleblood. Could wish for similar respect for the court's time from other members of the bar. With your lordship's permission. If that concludes the argument on behalf of the petitioner. Respondent, my lord. I shall return the hearing for rejoinders on Tuesday fortnight. Much obliged to counsel in the case. My lord. John Dice. John Dice and Caster, <laughs> my lord. <laughs> If you please, my lord. You made your mark today, Mr. Carstone. Oh, very Your first intervention. I remember the call previously. But you have taken Gridley's place. <laughs> See, how you amused the Lord. Uh, Mr. Carstone, I know you are busy, but would you spare a moment to hear a request? I would like you to be my executor. Yes, Mr. Carstone. Nominated, constituted, and appointed. My executor, administrator, and assigned. You are so very regular in your attendance here. Please oblige me, Mr. Carstone. If I should wear out, you see, you will be here to watch my case and wait for my judgment. You are the most regular suitor after myself. Will you be my executor, Mr. Carstone? Gladly, Miss Flight. I should deem it an honor to be considered. So very much obliged. I hope you have no objection, but I feel I have to tell you that I have recently added to my collection of birds two more. I call them the wards in John Rice. There they are, the little dears, caged up with all the rest, with hope, joy, youth, peace, rest, love, ashes, waste, want, ruin, despair, madness,
something done. Nothing's ever done. It's scarcely fair, sir. Tell me what's been done. Put the question differently, Mr. Carston. Ask what he's doing. A great deal is doing, sir. We've put our shoulders to the wheel, and the wheel is going round. The case goes round and round and round and will do forever. What hope can you give me? Excuse me, Mr. Carston, but I never give hopes. I told you that from the start, as I tell all my clients. For the sake of my good name in the legal profession, I never give hope. Hopes are not the business of the law. What is its business? Now, the one great principle of the English law is to make business for itself. <laughs> Even a mere child like me can see that, my dear friend. That is the symmetry of the law. Agreed, Bowles? Symmetry not being a legal term, Mr. Skimpole. I don't feel qualified to answer. <laughs> Captivating. <laughs> it is the poetry of the law to know nothing but the law, to mind its own business. You see? But what of my business? Our admirable friend Voles is making it more and more his business. Nothing's done. But doing, Mr. Carstone, doing. This desk, sir, is your rock. That's something. Since you came to me, you've been separately represented, not hidden and lost in the interests of others. That's something. The suit, sir, does not sleep. We wake it up, we air it, we walk it about. <laughs> That's something. It's no longer all jarndice in fact as well as in name. That's something. Nobody now is having it all his own way, sir. And that something, surely. John Jarndyce would have strangled the suit if he could. He might have had good intention. Not towards me. What about my interests? And my wife's. The suit, it's Jarndyce, Jarndyce and Carstone. In fact, as well as in name. Yes, Mr. Volds. That is something. Bringing me together with Mr. Volds in this room, Harold, was the best day's work you ever did. I work, my dear friend. <laughs> You know I'm incapable of it. Providence guided me. You must look to Voles. If we're to talk about it. Work. <laughs> As you know, Mr. Carston, I don't profess to be a man of capital. I admit it frankly. Because it is a principle of mine that there can never be too much openness between solicitor and client. Now, there have been many little consultations and attendances of late, as you'll agree, and uh, these things mount up. I can, of course, show you dates and times if you wish. There must ever be openness between us. But if you are satisfied to trust my word, I would be obliged for your signature on this draft I prepared. It's over 20 pounds. Of course, Mr. Fowles. When I ultimately congratulate you, sir, on your accession to fortune, although, as you know, I never give hopes, you will owe me nothing. Beyond whatever little balance may be then outstanding of the costs between solicitor and client. Uh, except, of course, for the taxed costs allowed out of the estate you are heir to. Two sets of costs. There, there have been several of, of these drafts. I pretend no claim upon you, Mr. Carston, but for the zealous and active discharge of my professional duty. 
not the languid and routine discharge of your experience elsewhere. Not, of course, that I ever disparage, as you know. My desk, sir, is your rock. I am always here, shoulder to the wheel. And my duty prosperously ended, all between us. I know you'll pull me through it, Mr. Bowles. He is the most reliable fellow in the world, isn't he, Harold? If a young man of the world like you says so, I accept your judgment unreservedly. <laughs> he seems a capital fellow to me because he looks like a lawyer and talks like a lawyer and is the very embodiment of the law and nothing but law. Now, I know nothing whatever of the law, and don't give a hoot for it. <laughs> but I know a picture of the law when I see one. And those is that portrait. <laughs> I'd have him hung in the Great Hall of Westminster. <laughs> Richard! Richard! Mr. Woodcourt called on us, Richard. Did you forget? Or was it to be today? I'm so sorry. Well, yes, I suppose I did forget. It, uh, it was stupid of me. Ill-mannered. So stupid. Woodcourt, please forgive me. Well, we found you now. It would only be this place or the other. How are you, Richard? I'm well enough. Of course I am. Ada, you haven't yet said good day to Mr. Skimpole. Ah. My dear Mrs. Castor, you arrive in this dreary street like the first day of summer. How fitting that a physician should bring you. The company of youth is a fine medicine. I prescribe it for myself. I practiced in the profession once, you know. For the brief time it took for the detail of sickness to disgust me. A physician's life is not poetic. A very realistic view, Mr. Skimpole. A child's view. What other reality does Harold Skimpole know? But a child's gaiety, a child's impulsiveness, a child's negligence. Trust. Where were you going, Richard? We were going to find a cab to take Harold home. Is Mr. Skimpole so much of a child that he cannot find a cab by himself? Ada, please! <laughs> Enough of a child to know when to scamper away, Mrs. Carstone. Whom I used to be allowed to call Ada. And she was also a child. Such a long time ago. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Harold. We'll meet shortly. We'll go home now, Richard. Alan came to see you as a doctor, as well as a friend. I don't have a medical term in the strict sense for what is wrong with him. He is sick. Not physically, at least no physical ailment is the cause of his sickness, but he is sick. Sick with anger, with worry, with bitterness. Sick with despair and with trying to pretend he isn't. I'm sorry, these are not a doctor's terms, but they add up to one fact. He is ill. I can tell you the name of the illness. It's called Chancery. Get him to turn his back on Chancery and we can make him well again. I'm afraid he's in no condition to see the logic of that. <laughs> Possessed. Oh, Rick. Forgive me, I have to be practical. What can we do? Richard's lawyer, Mr. Rolls, might we appeal to him? Do you know what kind of man he is? 
you've not met Mr. Voles. I can tell you exactly what he is. He's a very respectable man. All the greater attorneys who have made fortunes or who are making them would assure you that Mr. Bowles is a respectable man. Never misses a chance in his practice, which is a mark of respectability. Never takes any pleasure. Not a mark of respectability. He's reserved and serious, which is most respectable. And I'm sure his digestion is impaired, which is highly respectable. And he's making hay of the grass, which is his client's flesh. Who could be more respectable than Mr. Foles? No, Esther, I don't think we can help Richard by supplicating in that quarter. Does one ask a vampire not to suck blood? I wish Rick would let me see him again. Uh, Mr. Jarndyce, I took the liberty of suggesting to Richard that your advice and your regard for it, considering his needs, I hoped you wouldn't mind my... Pleading with him to allow me to visit him. No, I don't mind that. What did he say? He prefers not to see you. And how did he put it? What did he say? How much he blames me for what is happening to him? He is ill. Mr. Jarndyce, whatever Richard is thinking about you now cannot be of any consequence. Tell me what he said, Alan. He said he regards every new delay and every new disappointment as a new injury from John Jarndyce's hand. There is someone I will see. If someone asks me how I defend the legal abuses of that place, I say I don't defend them. But there is a shepherd youth, a friend of mine, who transmutes them into something highly fascinating to a man of my simplicity. Have I encouraged him, as you put it? What a question. Am I to discourage a young friend from trying to lighten the dark corners of this world? Do you receive money from this man, Voles, because of Richard? John Dice, you of all people know what I think of money. Oh, I would live without it if the world would let me, but it won't. So the world must provide me with what it insists I must have. I suppose there have been some trifling sums from Voles. Your share of Richard. Would Voles give me Richard's money? If you say he does, he must have a reason for it. But as you know, I've never understood matters of business. Is that what Richard is to you, Mr. Skimpole, a matter of business? He is my dearest friend. I love Richard. Perhaps I ought not to say that in your presence, John, since I believe he is not on good terms with you. But I can't help it. It's true. I love him. Mr. Skimpole, Richard has very little money. I thought he was immensely rich. He is in very embarrassed circumstances. He can still sign a bond or a cheque or a bill or put something on a file somewhere, can't he? Since he will take nothing from Mr. Jarndyce, he and Ada, Mrs. Carstone, have very small resources indeed. If you truly love Richard, Mr. Skimpole... I will stay away from him. Yes, Miss Thompson? Richard and Ada are very troubled at present. Mm. In fact, I've had very little enjoyment at dear Richard's lately. Mm. 
our young friends are losing the youthful poetry which was once so captivating in them. Why should I go there? When I go anywhere, I go for pleasure, because I was made for pleasure. I don't go anywhere for pain. It will be a perversion of the intention of my being. A monstrous thing to do. So you will leave Richard alone? You give me your word. John Dice. In common with most other men I have known, you are the incarnation of selfishness. I knew the danger Richard was in when I married him. I knew he was already losing himself. He was being swallowed up by chancery. And the lawyers, people pretending they cared. But I never imagined what it would come to. How much he would be hurt in every way. When we married, I hope because I was his wife, I could help him forget the case. Just put it aside. See it for what it is. A wicked thing that could do us nothing but harm. But even if I hadn't hoped like that, Esther, I would still have married him. Just the same. Just the same. Every day, I watch him in his sleep. I know every change in his face. When I married, I swore never to show him how much I grieve for what he did, which could only make him more unhappy. I want him when he comes home. Find no trouble in my face. I want him when he looks at me. See what it was he loved. Ada. But I have a new hope now. In a little while, there'll be someone else to help me win Richard back. Oh, Aid. He would never fail his child. When he sees the baby, he'll be restored. Do you think that too, Esther? Sure of it. But supposing he doesn't live to see the child. reason why Esther and Alan shouldn't be here as well. We've won. We've won! <laughs> Can't you hear me, Ada? <laughs> Richard, Richard, you're feverish and you're burning. Uh, everything's going to be all right. We have one. 
They found a new will. A true document. It changes everything. I can confirm all that. Mr. Kenge, my solicitor, called to see me earlier today. The document was found at Crook's old warehouse, among that sorrowful debris. Found by the same people who discovered my mother's letters to my father. They have been rewarded for their persistence. We can surely hope now that those sad premises will have no further influence on our lives. My father died there. And my mother was as good as killed there. I can't help but be afraid that only evil comes from that place. I fear for Richard and Ada. The will is genuine. Kenge believes it. Voles believes it. I wish to believe it. It's dated later than any other. And it makes Richard and Ada the principal beneficiaries. Maybe the happy end of John Dice and John Dice. I never thought there could be one. Being proved wrong might put Rick and me right again. Good night, Esther. Alan, you must make allowances for my age this evening. Good night. Good night, sir. I think, until this moment, I had not fully appreciated the depth of love that lies between you and your guardian. From my childhood, I have been the object of his untiring goodness. Whatever I can do in the rest of my life cannot be enough to express my gratitude. Confidential message from Mr. Kenge to Mr. John Jarndyce. <laughs> Mr. Guppy, forgive me for receiving a visitor like this. Oh. You are perfectly at liberty to wait for Mr. Jarndyce's return if you wish, but I'm sorry, I've no idea how late in the day that might be. Oh, Miss Summerson, I would willingly wait a day, a week, a month. Provided it was always in your presence, as you are at this moment, so naturally gracious in spite of interruption, and so caring of another's good opinion when that opinion can claim no right of consideration whatsoever. It's a matter of an hour or two only. Mr. Jarndyce is here in London. Please, sit down. Oh. Oh. Would you like a glass of wine or tea or anything else? Oh. To be in your company in this room is refreshment enough, Miss Summers. Please, Mr. Guffey. <sighs> you uh, wish to leave a message for Mr. Jambes? Ah, with reference to the suit in Chancery and the recent development. Mr. Kenge wishes to advise Mr. Jarndyce that there is further activity of what Mr. Kenge is pleased to call a hastening nature. It obliges Mr. Kenge to place himself very close to the suit indeed, on account of a settlement appearing imminent. 
Mr. Kenji's reputation in the profession is for cautiousness. But he feels sufficient confidence of his ground to recommend to Mr. Jarndyce that he hold himself in readiness for, in Mr. Kenji's word, a resolving of Jarndyce and Jarndyce. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Guppy. Your employer entrusts you with important news, and you in turn entrust me. Miss Summerson, what is a mere confidentiality is a measure of my respect for you. I have more than that to say to you. There has been a change in my circumstances, which I believe may be of direct significance to yourself, in view of what has passed between us on former occasions. I'm out of my articles, Miss Summerson. I am admitted on the role of attorneys in my own right. I've taken a house in Walcott Square, Lambeth, which has six rooms exclusive of kitchens, and I intend setting up professionally there forthwith. In the opinion of my friends, it's a most commodious tenement, Miss Summerson. You once rejected my proposal of marriage. Subsequent to that, due to matters over which I had no control, I believe my heart had relinquished the image of your beauty formerly imprinted upon it, and I gave you so to understand. And at that time, your conduct towards me was highly genteel. I might even say magnanimous. Miss Summerson, I was wrong. Your image stays in my heart. Its influence upon me is still tremendous. And yielding to it, I am willing to overlook completely the matters over which neither of us had any control. And renew my proposal. Let me prove that I can rise to a height of generosity to match your own. I beg to lay before you the house in Walcott Square and the business and myself for your acceptance. I beg you, Miss Summerson. You are very magnanimous indeed, Mr. Guppy. You could hardly have offered me more, or presented it more straightforwardly. I believe you will prosper and gain much respect in your profession. You reject me again? Please say why. I'm sorry. I can say nothing more to you than that I'm content with my life as it is. I wish you well, Mr. Guppy. State has dried up. Is that it, Mr. Kenge? We believe so, sir. Every penny has gone in costs. Yes, Mr. Kenge. So we understand. And the case is now dead. Old wills and new wills equally of no account because there is no money. None. Mr. Kent. The court has found it thus, sir. Richard.
away. If it please your lordship. Mr. Carstone, you no longer have any business to concern you here. I earnestly advise you to leave and give yourself and this court no further injury. in the world. the walls in Jandice and Jandice. Goodbye. Such an honor. Miss Esther, could you look, please, Miss?
Rick, you are at home. Bleak House is your home. Why did you keep your engagement secret? Wasn't it something to celebrate? Something for family and friends to be glad about? You didn't deliberately conceal it. We were glad. So please don't make it sound otherwise. It was an honest proposal made in Mr. Jarndyce's own modest way and accepted without any display which might embarrass him or myself. And since that time, we have respected each other's reticence. I will not call it secretive. The word isn't just. But if it is offensive to you, then of course I would join with my fullest apology. But you must understand my disappointment. Oh, that's a poor word for what I feel. I must ask you to say nothing more. I know I should not, but I cannot keep silent. I don't believe that any good will be served by letting more time go by and the truth left unsaid. I love you, and I wish to marry you. No! I love you. And I wish to marry you. I'm not free to hear you talk of love. If I thought my feelings for you threatened any injury to Mr. Jarndyce, then I believe I should stay silent. I believe it, though I can't be sure of it. My, my concern is with you. With your love, which I want above everything else. You must know, Esther that I wrote to Mr. Jarndyce, telling him of my feelings for you, knowing his oh. love for you as your guardian. His reply did not tell me, as you have done, that you and he had agreed to marry. What was his answer to you? That his dearest wish was for you to live in happiness with the husband that you would love. Oh. Are you asking me to choose between you? The question is, do you love Alan Woodcourt? How can I answer that? I'm not free. But if I made you free? Is that what you want? For your sake. It isn't enough to say that. I am not prepared to take another... kindness, another gift, as if this one meant no more than all the others. We promised each other our lives. 
Mr. Jandice, you must tell me plainly, do you no longer wish to be my husband? I've been selfish. I, I'm sorry. I, I was afraid of being alone again. When Woodcourt went away, for years or even forever, we both thought at the time, I suppose I seized the opportunity our own sense of desertion gave me. I always wanted to have someone to provide for, to protect, to cherish, to make me feel needed. Is that wrong? I love you, Esther, as if you were my own child, as I loved Ada and, 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 and Rick. It was wrong to ask you to marry me. Mr. John Dice, you will always be loved. When Woodcourt came back, I soon saw his wishes towards you, and I hold him in high regard. He's shared so much lately that has come near to crushing us. The question remains. Do you love him? Yes. You must forgive me my mistake. This is a moment of joy. It starts your new life. You've been hiding from the world since Richard's death. I thought I might never be able to leave this room again for the rest of my days. But that must not be. Richard wanted to begin the world. And so must we in his memory. Begin the world. This is your grandfather. Would you like to hold your grandson? I've never held a baby. in the world, Mr. Jarndyce. 